Okay. Uh, we'll look at keeping this relatively brief, hopefully less than an hour, uh, certainly not no, no more than an hour. Um, we'll talk about a few odds and ends uh, uh, regarding intelligence. Um, the first issue at hand, as always, is some operational definition. Interestingly, while I would assume everyone uh, feels like they have a pretty good handle on what intelligence is actually referring to, it's not actually that that straightforward. Uh, it's a fairly complicated um, question that there is considerable uh, controversy around actually uh, for a variety of reasons and we'll talk about some of those reasons today. Um, for our purposes though we'll go with a couple of different definitions uh, that are relatively solid. Um, so they pulled together back in the mid 90s they pulled together a statement um, from uh, 50 something experts in the in the field of intelligence measurement and theory uh, and this is what they produced uh, a very general mental capability that among other things involves the ability to reason plan solve problems think abstractly comprehend complex ideas learn quickly and learn from experience it's not merely book learning a narrow academic skill or test taking smarts rather it reflects a broader and deeper capability for comprehending our surroundings, catching on, making sense of things, or figuring out what to do. So, so relatively solid um, definition that I think is useful because it's making the point uh, that um, is often misunderstood. Uh, the assumption is often that um, academic capability and intelligence are practically synonymous and, and that, that actually is a lot of evidence to suggest that, that is not the case. Uh, so I like that, that uh, perspective in this attempt to operationally define the concept. Similarly, from the APA, from the American Psychological Association comes the ability to understand complex ideas, to adapt effectively to the environment, to learn from experience, to engage in various forms of reasoning, to overcome obstacles. They also characterize it as a given person, or they make the point that a given person's intellectual performance will vary on different occasions in different domains. So similar to the, to the statement from the 52 or so, um, experts in the field of intelligence measurement um, from the mid 90s um, in that it's making the point that, that you know we're not just talking about academic ability again a, a common misperception um, but I like the fact that the that the APA goes a little further and makes the point that um, that your capacity your intellectual capacity um, your your intelligence will vary according to circumstances. Um, the, the reality is, we're going to talk more about this here in just a little bit, but the reality is that the, the, the means by which we tend to measure what we think of as intelligence, we being the field of psychology, uh, the means by which we, we measure intelligence um, is it's a straightforward, fairly academic test. Granted, it's one that's um, that is reasonably varied. In other words, we're, we're assessing, we're trying to assess a range of domains of, of, of different types of intelligence. Uh, but it nevertheless remains, at this point, a pencil and paper test. Um, and just like any other pencil and paper test, on some days you're, you're in a better circumstance to perform well, just like you would be with any test. Um, so if we if we were to to do an IQ test with you, um, an intelligence test with you, um, on a day where you are 
coming down with the flu and you didn't sleep well last night and you just got into a fight with your mom or your dad or your significant other or whatever and uh, you got some back pain and I don't know, you're hung over. Um, just as would be the case with any task, any test, you're not going to perform very well. Your, your IQ, your intelligence quotient, is going to be lower that day than hypothetically it would be on a day where you know you got great sleep the night before, you had a healthy breakfast, all is well in your world, um, you know you just met the perfect person and you're happy and optimistic and energetic. Um, obviously, you're going to perform better on any test on that kind of a day. Um, so. Uh, this is to make the point that we think of intelligence as something special or mystical. It's, it's this absolute, how, in, how intelligent are you? What is your IQ? But the reality is, it's a, it's a malleable thing. Um, it varies according to circumstance. It varies according to, to context, right? Um, if you, you if you were to take um, well, if you were to take somebody like me and put me in an academic setting, I'm going to look very smart. You take me and you put me on a on a job site building a home, and I'm going to look as ignorant as I am. Uh, this, that, that's not an area that I'm that I'm strong in. I don't have a good knowledge base in that area. Uh, pretty meager actually, um, and there are going to be massive numbers of people who perhaps would not perform well academically in an academic setting who are going to run circles around somebody like me on a job site in terms of how to frame a house or or uh, put up siding or, or wrap a moisture barrier or whatever, right? Um, and those certainly... Um, those kind of skills certainly would fall under both definitions, certainly would fall under the APA definition of the ability to understand complex ideas, to adapt effectively to the environment, to learn from experience, to engage in various forms of reasoning, to overcome obstacles. Your ability to build a house or, or plumb a house or run electrical line or, or survive in the woods, all, all of these things would, would fall under the rubric of intelligence. So very broad idea, very difficult to kind of wrap yourself around entirely because it is so broad. Um, a third definition that I want to throw out for you is from a guy named David Wexler. Uh, and the reason why his opinion is important is that when you take an IQ test nowadays, almost certainly, the test you're taking was designed by Wexler. In fact, the, 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 what, what you think of as an IQ test are actually the Wexler tests, the Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale and the Wexler Intelligence Scale for Children are the two big ones. Um, and his, his very brief definition is the aggregate or glo global capacity of the individual to act purposefully, to think rationally, and to deal effectively with his or her environment. So sticking with our, uh, our emphasis on the complexity and the breadth of this thing that we think of as intelligence, I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about um, a way of thinking about intelligence that was proposed by a guy named Howard Gardner. And um, he really took this idea of what he characterized as multiple intelligences and ran with it. Um, and basically what he did is he broke down um, this, this thing that we call intelligence into eight general uh, divisions. And he characterized them as musical, rhythmic, visual, spatial, verbal, linguistic, logical, mathematical, bodily, kinesthetic, interpersonal, intrapersonal, and naturalistic. And we're going to go through what each one of these is referring to here in just a second. But I want to make the point that while he identified these eight, eight general divisions, uh, formally. He also made the point that um, arguably we also uh, 
possess relative degrees of what he would characterize as existential and or moral intelligence. Uh, so, so the capacity to, to think and uh, function um, morally and ethically and the capacity to um, wrestle with, to some degree, with, with some degree of success, wrestle with uh, existential issues. And existential issues basically are the big questions of life. Uh, what is the meaning and purpose of life? Why are we here? Uh, what makes life worth living? These kinds of things. Um, he didn't include those things formally. Uh, there are arguments that you can, that the, the, the building blocks, so to speak, of existential and moral intelligence are better accounted for in these other eight divisions, which we're going to talk about right now. So musical arrhythmic intelligence, uh, sensitivity to rhythm, pitch, meter, tone, melody, timbre, and sounds and music in general. Um, and basically, he included this uh, basically as a way of acknowledging that you you have people who um, perhaps if you sat them down and you and you um, ask them to take an, a, a, a traditional intelligence test, say one of the Wexler tests that I was referring to earlier, uh, that is that pencil and paper kind of an academic flavored test. Um, some musicians obviously are going to perform just fine on that. Other musicians. Uh, especially those who have limited education, um, probably are going to perform more poorly and are going to look less intelligent. But if you sit them down in front of a piano or, or, um, or ask them to sing, um, to, if you, once you get them in their world, um, a, a whole new dimension of, of, capacity opens up. Um, so points for anybody who can recognize all of these people in these various pictures. I would be very surprised uh, just simply because they're, they're old man. They're my generation people mostly. All right, so musical and rhythmic intelligence. Um, similarly, something that is not, uh, that often is not so well captured by IQ test is a visual spatial capacity. Uh, so when, when, you, when you take an IQ test, we do, we do have some, IQ tests are comprised basically, they're, they're, like I said, they're generally pencil and paper tests with a few additions, uh, and they're generally composed of approximately 10 subtests, right? And, and the, the, they're divided into two groups of subtests, uh, tests that are that are predominantly verbal. They're pulling for verbal skills, uh, and a, a, a group of tests that are pulling for nonverbal skills. And in that nonverbal uh, uh, set of subtests for a typical IQ test, uh, you do have a test that measures, in a limited way, the visual spatial uh, um, ability or capacity that a person has. Um, and it does so, the, 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 the big test, the, the, the well-known test that, that does this, um, is a, a block, what we call block design test. And it is, it's these little, probably inch cubes that uh, on the six sides, two of the sides are white, two of the sides are red, and two of the sides are, are half red, half white. And what they do is they give you a picture uh, on paper of a different of a, of a pattern, and then they give you blocks, and they ask you to replicate that picture using the blocks, manipulating the blocks, and putting them into like a little puzzle piece. Um, and uh, that starts out with a very very simple four block design, and it goes all the way up if you if you continue to successfully complete all of the, 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 uh, the, the questions, the, the, the puzzles, um, it goes all the way up to a fairly complex nine block design. Um, but that's really, and there's some other tests that, that, that kind of begin to touch on this a little bit, but um, there's, there's not a measure, there, there, there's no assessment in 
um, and a typical IQ test of um, the ability to draw, um, the ability to work with color and make things aesthetically pleasing, um, the ability to uh, frame a photograph or a, or a video. Uh, these things that, that they just are not well captured by a typical IQ test. And Gardner was making the point that no, this is this is definitely if you if you watch a uh, a John Ford Western, say, uh, John Ford is a director and he's very he's famous for his uh, I want to say cinematography. I don't know if that's actually the right term, but but when you when you see frames from his movies, if you're familiar with uh, with westerns generally and and with movie making. Westerns in particular and movie making generally, uh, if you see a John Ford, a clip from a John Ford movie, it's instantly recognizable because he, he was a he was a genius in, in terms of framing shots. Um, so Gardner's making the point that uh, that while our IQ tests do speak to this in a limited way, um, they don't fully measure uh, the visual spatial capacity that characterizes, say, a great, um, a great drawer, a great artist, uh, a, a great photographer, videographer, architect, these kinds of things. So Gardner also uh, included, not surprisingly, uh, when we talk about intelligence, uh, verbal linguistic, verbal linguistic capacity, which I apparently don't have. Uh, facility with words and language. Typically, these people are good at reading, writing, telling stories, memorizing words. Um, and obviously, IQ tests um, um, are actually fairly good at measuring this. Uh, um, we we include in, in inevitably in IQ tests, certainly in the Wechsler tests, uh, they look at vocabulary, they look at your un, your ability to comprehend language, um, your ability to this is more of a visual spatial thing, but your ability to tell stories, uh, basically they give you a, a, a subtest that gives you cards that have pictures on it. Um, and your your job is to look at, you know, these three, four, five, six cards, um, look at the various pictures on them and figure out what order to put the cards in to tell a story that makes some sense. And again, the stories, all these IQ tests, the subtests on all, all IQ tests, start out very e with easy, easy questions and progressed to very difficult questions um, with the idea being that each subtest has questions that are sufficiently difficult that the vast majority of people are going to be unable to answer them. Uh, it is a very, 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 very rare person. Less than 1% of the people who take an IQ test can complete every question on the IQ test. It's just extraordinarily unusual. And that's the, that's the whole design. Um, and we'll talk about why here in a little bit. So uh, Gardner uh, made the point that um, uh, uh, one of these dimensions of intelligence, in his view, and nobody would argue with him, is verbal and linguistic. In a similar way, again, nobody would dispute this, uh, he included logical and mathematical capacity, Lo uh, the ability to use logic, abstraction, reasoning, numbers, manipulation of numbers, critical thinking, capacity to understand the underlying principles of some some kind of causal system. So this is basically mathematics and the basis for science, the, the ability to think analytically. Um, and again, uh, our, our IQ tests are heavily bent in this direction. Uh, we actually have a subtest that is mathematical reasoning. Um, and there are a fair number of many of the subtests uh, get at different aspects of analytical reasoning. That block design subtest that I gave you, that I was describing to you, for that, that helps to measure visual spatial reasoning. Well, that's that is also that also is looking at your ability um, to think critically and replicate patterns, right? As, as do a number of the other subtests excuse me, the other subtests on a, on a Wexler IQ test. We will we'll go through each of the subtests and I'll describe what they are here in, in just a little bit uh, so that you have a basic idea of what you get yourself into if you ever take an IQ test. Okay, now a dimension that probably does fall outside the 
realm that most people would consider to be a measure of intelligence. And that's what Gardner called the bodily kinesthetic dimension, uh, referring to control of one's bodily motions, capacity to handle objects skillfully, sense of timing, a clear sense of the goal of a physical action, along with the ability to train responses, generally good at physical activities such as sport, dance, acting, and making things. If this strikes you as <clears throat> counterintuitive, at least, take a second and think about you know, the, the, the American Psychological Association, their definition included the idea that intelligence is the ability to understand complex ideas, but it's also the ability to adapt effectively to the environment, to learn from experience, to overcome obstacles, all of which uh, have a physical component or can have a physical component. Heck, the guy that's that's the, the author of the primary intelligence tests, IQ tests that we use today, David Wexler, we, we talked about his definition for intelligence um, um, earlier in this lecture. Uh, he says it's the aggregate or global capacity of the individual to act purposefully, to think rationally, and to deal effectively with the environment. And uh, while the Wexler tests do not include any component to assess this bodily kinesthetic uh, dimension of intelligence or proposed dimension of intelligence, Certainly him making the point that it's a global capacity to act purposefully and to deal effectively with your environment um, suggests that this is not an unreasonable dimension. Um, I, I, I think we all know individuals who have a superior ability to adapt quickly to learn new movements. Um, I, I certainly know in working with people in, in, um, in kind of the fitness realm and working with people in the gym and teaching new movements, say teaching somebody how to squat or how to deadlift, um, there are people who you, for whom you can just describe the movement, um, give them a few cues and they can almost immediately uh, uh, give the movement that you're describing. They can make their body do what you're rec what you're describing to them, um, and they can do it often without even looking in a mirror. They they have a sense of where their body is in space and how to make it move the way you're you're proposing to have it move. On the other hand, I know people who are very very bright in a traditional way of talking about being intelligent, um, who. <laughs> Frankly, even if you, you know, say if I was going to teach them how to how to pick up an object off the floor, in this case, what we call deadlifting, right? Um, even manipulating them with hands, you know, even moving their body into position and, and holding it there and then helping them uh, make the movement appropriately, having them look in the mirror, modeling it for them and having them imitate it, um, still struggle to replicate that movement. Um, this certainly says something about their capacity to adapt, to survive, um, to deal effectively with their environment. So as, as counterintuitive as it might be, I think Gardner has a very good argument that, that, that there is a bodily kinesthetic component to intelligence, especially if we think of intelligence primarily as the ability to learn adaptively the ability to learn in such a way that you're better suited for, to, to, to cope with your environment. If that's intelligence, then he's making a pretty good argument. Another, actually the, the next two are going to be ones that we don't generally think of as a kind of traditional components of intelligence. Uh, in this case, the interpersonal dimension. High interpersonal intelligence is characterized by sensitivity to others' moods, feelings, temperaments, motivations, well-developed ability to cooperate, communicate effectively, and empathize easily. Um, empathize uh, is, empathy is the capacity to develop 
a sense of how the other person is feeling. In fact, even even more than that, um, somebody who's 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 um, empathically inclined will tend to, when they're talking to somebody who's sad, will tend to experience sadness. Um, they're very tuned in emotionally to the people around them and, and tend to experience a similar emotional state uh, to the person, a, a state that's similar to the emotional state of the person that they're that they're interacting with. Um, I, I can tell you as somebody who, when I was younger, uh, was relatively weaker in this dimension um, in terms of being sensitive to other people's moods, being empathic, uh, um, um, having a well-developed ability to cooperate. No, I did not. Uh, but I went to graduate school with people, predominantly female, uh, that may have been just a function of the number of people in the graduate program because they were mostly female, um, who seemed to have been born this way. They were remarkably gifted. They understood people intuitively even before the before their academic training. They were very tuned in emotionally to the people around them. They read people very, very well. Um, so, I... It, and again, if we're talking about the capacity to adapt to the environment, um, act purposefully, uh, it, it's a reasonable thing because we are social animals um, uh, to, to make this argument. Certainly, you could make a very effective argument. I don't know whether there's research to support this, but certainly anecdotally, um, any middle-aged adult can point to friends, people that they went to college with, this sort of thing, or people they didn't go to college, um, who have had remarkably successful careers predominantly on their ability to understand people, get people to like them, and convince people convince a salesman, uh, a real estate agent or a, bro or a mortgage broker, uh, even a banker. A, a, you know, a lot of success in business is understanding what is motivating other people, connecting with those people, getting those people to respond positively to you. Um, it, 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 and, and we think, okay, well, that's, that's the modern age. Well, what about, what about, you know, 13,000 years ago? Well, 13,000 years ago, um, your ability to motivate others, to elicit cooperation from others, to cooperate with them, uh, certainly was profoundly important in promoting your survival and the survival of, of your family and friends and such. Uh, so, uh, again, not your traditional um, uh, uh, way of thinking about intelligence, but a fairly easy dimension to argue in favor of, as is the intrapersonal dimension. So intrapersonal uh, is, is, so interpersonal is between people, intrapersonal is within the person. So somebody who has a high degree of intrapersonal intelligence is introspective, they, they, they're, they're good at looking inward and understanding what's going on internally. They have well-developed self-reflective capacities. They have a good understanding of themselves and what makes them, them tick, so to speak. Uh, a good awareness of, of one's own strengths and weaknesses, of what makes you unique, of being able to predict your reaction to something, your emotional response to something. Um, th these are people that we generally regard as fairly uh, psychologically stable, perhaps even wise. Um, they understand themselves and in understanding themselves have a better capacity to understand others uh, in, in being tuned into their own joy and pain, suffering and, and um, success. Uh, they 
better appreciate and can relate to and can connect with that of others. Um, so, so intrapersonal and interpersonal in these dimensions are, are, are fairly closely related. Not that you can't be high in one and, and low in the other or vice versa, uh, but they're, they're arguably similar um, skill sets. Uh, yeah, I, I, and again, uh, perhaps not as clearly as the interpersonal dimension, but certainly you can see somebody who reads themselves well, understands themselves, understands uh, his, his or her cap own capacities, weaknesses, strengths, is, it has a survival advantage, has a success advantage, certainly. Again, just basing it on the definitions that were given, you know, that the, the, the definitions that I provided for you at the beginning, the three definitions, Wexler, the APA, and then the, the intelligence experts. Those are pretty standard definitions, and according to those definitions, these dimensions that Gardner is proposing make a lot of sense. Um, perhaps the one that I'm least convinced by, uh, just my opinion, um, in Gardner's um, uh, model is naturalistic intelligence, which he described as nurturing, as a capacity to nurture and relate to the environment, excuse me, the capacity to nurture and relate information to one's environment, to one's natural surroundings, ecological receptiveness, holistic understanding of the world. I, I, I will acknowledge I have not, I'm not familiar with Gardner's argument uh, in favor of this being a separate dimension. It strikes me that that these perspectives, uh, the, the one's ability in this area uh, could reasonably be accounted for by the other dimensions that he introduces. Um, analytical reasoning, language-based stuff, uh, interpersonal awareness, these kinds of th th those those dimensions. Um, that being said, uh, a, a reasonable way of, of a reasonable argument to have. So as appealing as Gardner's idea of multiple intelligence, multiple intelligences is, um, there's a number of fair criticisms. Uh, uh, the, the, the first one is the argument that that what he's actually talking about um, are aptitudes or abilities or strengths um, rather than intelligence itself. Um, interesting argument. Um, I, I, I'm not sure how reliably or validly you can tease out intelligence as we've defined it today from um, useful abilities. Um, a more powerful criticism of Gardner's thinking is that it's somewhat uh, what we would call tautological. Uh, a tautology is a, a, a logical fallacy, a, a mistake of logic in which you prove something using itself essentially. So, so in this case, it's, it's him saying, uh, you know, that, that musical ability is, a, is an intelligent, is an, is a type of intelligence. Um, and the way you know that a person is intelligent in terms of musical ability is that they're good at music. And you're good at music if you have well-developed musical ability. So it's circular, right? It's proving itself. Same thing with physical ability and so on and so forth. Um, Further, there's not a lot of empirical data as yet to support his perspective. Um, none of this is to say that what he's arguing for is invalid um, or untrue, uh, but but there are there are some some legitimate gripes that people have. The biggest legitimate gripe that people have um, is Gardner's prediction that. Um, these these types of intelligence that he's proposing are fairly independent of one another, right? That that um, somebody who is high in physical intelligence uh, 
that 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 strength in physical intelligence or musical intelligence or intrapersonal intelligence doesn't necessarily imply that you're going to have strengths in other areas. Um, in fact, this is uh, this is inconsistent with what we know about intelligence. What we know about intelligence is people who are smart in one area tend to be smart in multiple areas. People who have a high level of intelligence in one of the areas that's well studied, say on the Wechsler tests, somebody who scores very strongly on, a, on one subtest usually scores fairly strongly on, on other subtests. Uh, and that's a particular concept in and of itself. We're going to talk about that next. So this idea that um, essentially that people who are smart in one area, say verbal, uh, say, say vocabulary or general fund of knowledge, tend also to be relatively smart in other areas, say mathematics or visual spatial reasoning or similar, um, the ability to think quickly, say. Um, this idea um, supports uh, the theory of what a guy named Charles Spearman, one of the early uh, renowned intelligence researchers called G uh, or, or the G factor. And this was basically his assertion that there is an underlying fundamental kind of linked intelligence overall. Um, that and, and he was basically saying smart people tend to be smart across dissimilar tasks. People, smart people tend to be smart, generally speaking, relatively speaking, across the board. Um, and people who perform poorly um, on a subtest or a few subtests of an IQ test tend to perform more poorly across the rest of them, too. Uh, Put, put bluntly, smart people are smart generally, and people who aren't so smart aren't so smart generally. Um, there are exceptions to this. There are what we call splinter skills. So somebody who performs poorly across most of, uh, say, an IQ test, um, but extraordinarily well um, in one thing, in one subtest or a couple of subtests. You see this uh, in the case of autism, uh, people who will who will perform relatively poorly across most of the test, but extraordinarily well, say in the case of Asperger's syndrome, extraordinarily well on a vocabulary sub, sub test, say. Uh, um, and sometimes you get the converse too. You get somebody who performs very well across most of the sub tests, but really bombs one thing, perhaps because of localized brain damage. You know, they had a head injury and they have a particular deficit area, something like that. But by and large, uh, Spearman's G, uh, the predictions made by Spearman's G, uh, this idea of a G factor, a general intelligence factor, um, s stands up pretty well, uh, and, the, and the statistics bear it out. Um, we don't know why this is the case. Um, there seems to be some degree of relative efficiency across the brain in terms of capacity to think and problem solve and plan and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, but beyond that, we don't, we aren't really sure why we find it. Let me give you a quick example of what I'm talking about. Okay, so this, this chart is basically showing the relationship between scores on various subtests on a Wechsler scale. Um, and going across the top there, I'll just tell you, uh, I'll give you a quick description of what each of these are. Uh, vocabulary is exactly, V is vocabulary, it's exactly what it sounds like. Uh, S is uh, similarities, and it's basically um, asking the person to identify uh, uh, in what way two objects are similar to one another, in what way are an apple and an orange alike, right? Uh, information is exactly what it sounds like it is. It's, it, it's, it's assessing the fund of information, the facts that a person possesses. C is comprehension, uh, it's looking uh, it, it's, it's, it's asking questions to understand how well you can use the vocabulary and the information that you possess um, to think uh, rationally. Uh, picture arrangement is a uh, visual 
test. Uh, I think I've already described this to you before, um, in which you're given a series of cards within, with, with pictures, simple line drawing pictures on them. And you take these cards and you arrange them in order to tell a, a story that makes sense. Um, block design, BD is block design. It's that test that I described to you earlier, of, uh, an assessment of visual spatial reasoning. A is arithmetic, which is exactly what it sounds like. PC is picture completion. And it's basically a line, uh, cards are presented to you with line drawings on them of objects. And in each drawing, there is something missing. There's a detail missing and you have to be able to tell what that detail is that is missing. Digit span is also exactly what it sounds like. It's like uh, you are, they, they, they read to you uh, a series of numbers and you're asked simply to repeat them back. Uh, that's the first part of the digit span subtest. The second part, of the, and, and uh, all of these things become more difficult as they go. Vocabulary words become more difficult. Similarities become more subtle. Uh, the information questions become more complicated and more more uh, kind of esoteric, et cetera, et cetera. Um, um, in the digit span subtest, you know, it starts out and it's maybe three or four digits. And every time you get one right, it gets a little bit longer, a little bit longer, a little bit longer uh, until presumably we're going to exceed your uh, working memory capacity. Um, and then after you've done that first half of the digit span subtest, we, we, may, we further complicate the issue and we say, okay, I'm gonna read you a series of numbers and I want you to repeat them back to me in reverse order. So if I say eight, six, seven, you have to say seven, six, eight. And same thing, those we present, every one you get right, we present it with longer and longer and longer uh, series of numbers. Um, OA is object assembly. It's basically putting together a puzzle. Uh, and DS is digit symbol. And this is essentially, uh, you have a, a key of, of symbols that are paired with a number. So one symbol with the number one, a different symbol with the number two, a, a, a third symbol for the number three, and so forth up to 10 symbols, if I remember correctly. Uh, and then what we have you do is as quickly as you can, we give you, um, we give you the, uh, uh, on the lower part of the page, we, we, we give you boxes that have a number in them and you have to fill in as quickly as you can, as many as you can in the allotted time, uh, the corresponding symbols to all of these numbers, right? Um, so, yeah, the basic picture of these subtests. What this chart is is laying out for you is, uh, if you go all the way over to the left of the chart and you look at the at the V, the vocabulary subtest, and you go straight down, well, V, the vocabulary subtest is correlated 100% with the vocabulary subtest, right? It's the same test. But if you go down and you look at people who score well in the vocabulary subtest, there's a 0.67 correlation on a similarities subtest. Remember that that's high. Anything above 0.5 is strong. Uh, vocabulary subtest. If we look at people who who how they perform, people who perform well on the vocabulary subtest uh, tend to have a high correlation. They tend to score well on the information subtest. 0 0.72, 0 0.70 on the comprehension subtest, and on down. And basically, what you're looking at there as you go down that that first column with the vocabulary subtest. As you go down into arithmetic, picture completion, digit span, object assembly, and digit symbol, what you're looking at is uh, um, uh, tests that are moving further and further and further away from that verbal uh, domain, that verbal comprehension domain, uh, and more toward nonverbal visual spatial uh, um, um, requirements. But what you'll notice is there are a lot of, of 0.5s and higher here. Uh, and certainly if you move it down to a, a, say a 0.35 and higher, there's a tr there's tremendous correlation among these 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 subtests. This supports uh, the the um, uh, Spearman's assertion that there is this general intelligence. So what I was giving you there with the subtest for the Wexler uh, tests, I want to give you a little more information about them. Um, a couple things to bear in mind. Uh, the first one is IQ points are not percentage points. And I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to show you this in a graph in just a minute, but I want to hit these points and then we'll come back to them and we'll look at it graphically. Um, IQ points are not percentage points. Um, an average IQ is a hundred. 
um, there is a range, the average range for IQ is 85 um, to 115. When you get above 115, you're beginning to talk about above average. When you get below 85, you're looking at below average. Um, when you get down to 70, uh, so 100 is average. The, as you move down from 100, the lower limit of the average range is 85. As you continue to move down and you get 30 points away from 100 or two standard deviation, 15, the standard deviation on an IQ test is 15 points. You get two standard deviations away from that average score of 100 and you get it down to 70. And 70 is where cognitive impairment uh, begins to be a concern, right? Uh, what we used to call mental retardation, uh, the, the 70 is kind of the cutoff score where you really start to, to, to consider diagnosing somebody with a cognitive disability. 95% um, of the population is within two standard deviations of the mean, two standard deviations of 100. So 95% of the population scores between 70 and 130. Um, and 98% of the population scores below 131. So if you score above a below, uh, above a, a, an IQ score of 131, you're pretty damn smart. Um, so the average range, score of a, IQ score of 85 to 115, 100 being the average IQ score, um, about two thirds of the population, right? So six, 66, 67 percent of the population fall within this average range. Um, now bear in mind. We're not, the, uh, the, the IQ scale, um, 100 is average, 85 to 115 is the average range, um, 70 to 130 is 98% of the population, um, is not an ordinal scale. So it's not, it's not rank ordered. It's not that, oh, if you have a score of 130, uh, that you're twice as smart as somebody with a score of 65. That's not that's not the that's not the relationship that we're describing here. Um, what we're describing is essentially ranking relative to the rest of the population. Um, maybe maybe better to think of it in terms of percentiles. You know, how, how much of the population do you score better than or worse than? Um, Wexler scores have very good the, 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 this 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 most popular IQ test. Uh, the Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale and the Wexler Intelligence Scale for Children have very good uh, reliability um, and, and strong validity. In other words, uh, with, if you take an IQ test and you get one score um, at a particular time in your life and you take it again a number of years later, or a number of weeks later, or a number of months later, the likelihood you're going to score within a certain um, range of measurement, a certain error uh, range, um, I mean, they're acknowledging, yes, you're going to have some variability depending on how you're feeling that day and how much sleep you got the night before and that kind of stuff that we talked about. But but you're going to score within a certain fairly narrow band pretty reliably on this test. That's a good sign. That means that's, that's a suggestion that the test is actually measuring something consistently. Uh, and there does appear to be good validity, that it does appear to be measuring what we think of as intelligence. Um, the other interesting thing is that that there's a strong correlation, about a 0.7 correlation between IQ testing and achievement testing. In other words, um, IQ is highly core, what you get on these intelligence tests is highly correlated with academic achievement. So the better you score on an IQ test, the likelihood is it's not perfect. It's not a perfect correlation because um, effort counts, right? There are other variables, um, but there's a good strong correlation between IQ testing and achievement testing. Uh, this is a uh, graphic representation of the actual structure of a, of, of a Wexler test. I want to say this might be the adult, the Wexler adult intelligence scale. Um, you have your full scale IQ, which is that number, 100 being average, 85 to 115 being the average range, et cetera, et cetera. So that's your full, full scale IQ. You get a similar number. Um, for that, that is basically a summary of your verbal subtests and your nonverbal or your performance subtest, your verbal IQ and your performance IQ. Under the verbal IQ, uh, you have what we call the verbal comprehension index, and that is comprised simply of uh, vocabulary, similarities, information, and 
comprehension, we've already talked about those subtests, and a working memory subtest, which they categorize as falling under, um, under your basic verbal skill set. Um, and the working memory index is comprised of arithmetic, digit span, um, and letter number sequencing, which we didn't talk about, which for, for our purposes in this class isn't really particularly important. Um, the nonverbal portion or the performance IQ portion of the intelligence test um, is is comprised of two sub two groups of subtests the perceptual organizational index which is that picture completion test can you can you supply the missing item in a visual uh, in, 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 a, in a line drawing of something um, how well is how how how, uh, how good are you at the block design at, at putting at replicating patterns with three-dimensional objects with those blocks um, and, and again matrix reasoning which it, we won't talk about they're, 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 It's just not pertinent for what we're doing. Um, and then there's a processing speed. How quickly do you think, um, which is that uh, digit symbol coding that I talked about um, and something called symbol search, which again, uh, I, I wanted to give you a basic picture of what most of the subtests look like, uh, but, be, but knowing all the details of all the subtests isn't particularly important. Uh, so you've got a full scale IQ, you got basically a verbal and a nonverbal component to it. On the verbal component to it, you're looking at how well do you comprehend things verbally, uh, how well developed is your working memory capacity. On the nonverbal end of things or the performance end of things, you have uh, perceptual organizational skills, which are essentially nonverbal thinking skills, and how quickly do you think. Okay. I said to you that I would represent all the numbers that I was giving you a couple of slides ago graphically. Um, and what you see there, it, the, the, the bell curve in, I guess that's orange, um, at the top of this slide, uh, bell curve, normal curve, is basically showing you the distribution of IQ scores. And if you look down all the way at the bottom um, of this slide, you will see actually uh, the the, the IQ scale itself with 100 at, as the mean, as the average, um, 85 to 115 comprising approximately 68% of the population, approximately 98% of the population falling between 70 and 130, um, and essentially 100% of the population falling at 145 or below. It's like 99.9% .9 or 99.8 something percent. And you'll also see there, this is this is an old chart, but you'll also see there um, corresponding ACT, SAT, and percentile uh, scores. I don't remember why I have this chart in here. I was obviously going to come back and make a reference to it again, uh, but for our purposes, ignore this particular chart. Sorry. Okay. Um, Last thing that I'm going to talk about here is, oh, and believe me, there are so many things we could talk about that would get potentially get me in so much trouble because there is it is so easy to start treading into very controversial areas. Um, we'll talk broadly about the heritability of intelligence. In other words, basically how how genetically loaded is intelligence how much of how much of IQ is inherited uh, the, I think this this serves as a good stand-in for a lot of the other controversial areas uh, does sex affect intelligence are males smarter than females or females smarter than males in any broad way uh, are there differences between the races are there differences between uh, people in different socio socioeconomic strata in, in society etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, this becomes a big deal because there are those who uh, would feel comfortable assigning implicit value to human being human beings on the basis of their intelligence. Um, in other words, saying that somebody who is uh, highly intelligent is inherently more valuable than somebody who is well below average of an in, in intelligence. Um, if this strikes you as um, as implausible that somebody would be so harsh 
as to make such a judgment, um, I would suggest that you look over uh, over in Europe and to a lesser extent even in America. There's a little more pushback in America, but in Europe, I want to say it was Norway um, that is undertaking uh, to eliminate Down syndrome um, from their population uh, by using abortion. Uh, so their idea is that identifying people because you can identify with some degree of accuracy the people with Down syndrome prior to birth and then eliminating uh, that birth by abortion. Um, and certainly, I, I think it's a fairly straightforward argument to make that that the, with the implicit assertion here is that this person, because of their lower level of of intelligence, which to be fair is a it's it's a it's impaired. Uh, you know, the person. People with that with Down syndrome generally perform below 70 on an IQ test, so they are in that impaired range, that range of cognitive disability. But I, I think when you look at this, and this is not just unique to Norway, by the way, this is this is a fairly broad, um, depending on your perspective, problem. Um, uh, there does seem to be a degree of comfort with el eliminating this group of people on the basis of Fundamentally, not that the, not it's the not that it's the only variable in Down syndrome. There are some medical problems and such that are also accompany. But the, but the primary thing that concerns most people around Down syndrome is the fact that they are cognitively disabled. Um, so this is a real issue, um, and you can see a, just from that little snapshot how if you start talking in terms of is one race stronger. Uh, in, in performance on intelligence testing than another race, um, you get it, you, you again, you find yourself in, immersed in that question of, does this imply anything about individual human value? So it's a very, it, it can become a very poisonous debate. Uh, and I feel bad for the people, frankly, who are in intelligence testing because it is, it's a, it's a very easy thing for earnest, frankly, kind of nerdy, um, idealistic uh, academics to become pretty vilified, pretty hated. Uh, there's a guy, uh, I can't think, I want to say his last name is Murray, uh, who wrote a book a number of years ago um, uh, called The Bell Curve about intelligence. Um, and he had a chapter, he made the mistake of including a chapter on uh, what the research was uh, around race and he has paid for it ever since then, um, despite the fact that he was very careful in the book. If you actually read the whole thing, which 99% of the population didn't do, including all the people who were covering it, it was a big deal in the news. Um, he was very careful in the book to uh, be very explicit about the limits of the research and about the fact that he was bringing the, these questions up out of concern for racial equality and out of concern for avoiding some of the the human rights abuses that take place around these questions. All that being said, he paid for it and continues to pay for it to this day because he is still alive. Um, so I'm not getting involved in all that stuff. Uh, I want to acknowledge that it's there. I want to acknowledge there's a lot of controversy around it. Um, the one thing I will speak to is to the general idea of heritability of intelligence, how much of it is genetically determined, because we, we have pretty good data on that. Uh, and what you'll see here is just a quick um, graphic representation of the degree to which genetics um, is correlated with IQ, um, how genetically loaded IQ is. Uh, and what you'll see there uh, is that when you have uh, at the bottom of the chart is identical twins reared together, meaning identical twins, so they, they are 100% the same genetically, and they are raised in the same environment. If you go up from there, identical twins raised apart. Um, you get about uh, a correlation of about 0.75 um, for identical twins raised apart, so they share genetic material but not environmental influence. Um, and you get about a 0.86 uh, correlation between identical twins raised together, so identical genetic material 
and presumably fairly similar uh, uh, physical environment. So, and, and if you go up in the chart there, um, all the way at the top, un, unrelated persons reared apart. So this is people who do not share any genetic material and they're not raised in the same environment. There is zero correlation. There, there's, no, there's no way of predicting knowing one person's IQ what another person's IQ is going to be. Unrelated people. So um, um, you, you have two siblings uh, who are adopted from separate families and they, they grow up in the same household, but they don't share any genetic material. Uh, raised together, you're looking at about, what does that be, about, about a 0 0.24, uh, 0 0.25 correlation. So um, uh, your, your, your ability to predict the one person as opposed to the other person's IQ um, is fairly limited. You have a, about a 0.25 correlation. Uh, if you know this person's IQ, you may be able to predict this other, this other, this other person's IQ. When they do not share genetic material, they're raised together. Um, so what this is telling us is there is a significant genetic component. It is not 100%. Um, and I mean, I would say that probably the best, the best evidence of this is that second to the bottom uh, 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 row there, identical twins reared apart, you got about a 0.76 correlation in, in their IQ. So if you know one uh, person's identical twins IQ, you have uh, a 0.76 likelihood you're going to be able to predict the other person, the other identical twins IQ when they have been raised separately. So their environments are different. That's still a pretty 0.7. Remember we, we were saying, you know, anything, anything 0.5 or above is a pretty strong correlation. So what this is saying is that there is definitely, and this kind of makes sense because that, that there is definitely a strong genetic component. Uh, not that environment is not important. It is de absolutely important. Environment appears to be important in terms of getting you as close as possible to your genetic potential. Obviously, environment cannot lead to you exceeding your genetic potential because that's a hard limit. But so, so basically, the downside is this: you can screw somebody up environmentally. You know, they can have potential that you never allow them to reach because they're malnourished or they're 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 emotionally or physically. Uh, neglected because they're abused, because they're exp uh, uh, exposed to trauma, et cetera, et cetera. So you can, you can, you can um, sabotage them with environment um, or you can use environment to get as close to their genetic potential as possible. Genetics is a very powerful factor in overall intelligence. That would make sense given that um, essentially what it's doing is, is laying down the framework for the structure of the brain and, and how well the brain functions um, in terms of of communication, interaction within structures of the brain, that sort of thing. Um, not that environment is not a factor there. Certainly it can be. Uh, you, you, damage can be can be caused by head injury and again, malnutrition, this sort of thing. But, but what essentially this is saying is that, that clearly there is a strong biological component to intelligence. Surprise, surprise. Intelligence is a function of a biological entity, the brain, how well the brain is is interacting with itself, how efficiently and how quickly it's interacting with itself. So, and with the environment. Um, so at any rate, that's all I'm gonna say. I wanted to make sure that I, I got that information out there. I am not treading onto other ground around sex, around race, any of that stuff, because frankly, the, the, the data is fairly controversial still. Um, and, um, it is definitely something that we need to take a wait and see attitude and be very cognizant of the reality that a person's intelligence, at least in my mind, uh, and this is what I do for a living, in my mind, uh, a person's intel intelligence has essentially zero to do with their value as a human being. Their value as a human being is absolute. It is not, uh, um, impacted by how smart or not smart they happen to be. That's the final thing I'm going to say on it. All right. Good luck with studying and see you in next class.